Now we're live on Facebook. So uh, once again, welcome to the fourth day of Sword Squatch, uh, Sword Squatch 2020, Cyber Squatch. Today we're doing some cutting at home with Philip Martin. I'm going to start off real quick with a video from uh, Purple Heart Armory, who's our basically sponsoring the lectures today. We've got some quick little nifty videos from them. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hello, Sword Squatch. I'm Natasha Darcy with Purple Heart Armory, and that? I wanted to welcome you to our virtual vendor yes. booth, since we can't be there in nice. person. So welcome to the Purple Heart Armory table. So the first installment, I'm going to show you some of our new VB items. Uh, some of them have been out for a little while. Some of them are brand new, and you probably haven't even seen them yet. So first, people have been really asking for our Hungarian saber. So this has a new knuckle bow on it. Very strong blade. It's not quite like our gymnasium saber. It's a much thicker blade and it does have fuller on either side. Pretty strong, nice rounded tip. So that is now available on the website. Our next one is our saber. I'm sorry, the messer. And you have seen this before, but we have completely upgraded the handle, it's now a composite material, not the wood grip that you're probably used to seeing. So we just ran out of the others, and so these are gonna be the ones that are now available on the website. Next, you've probably seen this, I've been showing this on Instagram quite a bit. This is our Fiore Fetter. So this is coming in at 51 inches. If you do want it shortened, we can do that. What we will do is remove the spatulated tip and roll the tip ourselves. So if you do want that done, you can put a note in the comments for that. But currently it does have a nice spatulated tip. No shilt for you Fioris out there. And our same standard pommel and handle. And then last, we have had for a little while, but hasn't really gotten too much notice. But this is our standard fetter but we have made it to be a little more flexible. So some of you do like to thrust more with your sparring or you wanna be a little bit nicer to your partner. So we've made these, they're at about a 20 pound uh, rate to for flex. Our moderate, which is also on the website, has a 30 pound and then our standard fetter available in spatulated and the roll tip are at 40 pound. So come back by in a little bit and I'll open another box and show you some new items. Um, by the way, I don't know if you caught that code at the end there. There's a, an active code on Purple Heart Armory's website today, uh, S2020. It's a 10% discount and it's active all day. So get yourself something nice. Um, now, I think that I've gone over everything I need to. So I'm gonna, I think we are good to go with uh, learning some cutting. Um, Oh, yes, and uh, I should also mention that. Um, if you'd like to share your screen, just ask us in the, the Q, with the Q&A feature or use the raise your hand feature, and we'll basically upgrade you to a panelist and allow you to share your video. That way you can get some cutting feedback from Phil if you're able to do any cutting today. So uh, with that, let me spotlight Phil here and take it away. Hi. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right. Well, my name is Philip Martin. I'm the cutting instructor at the Phoenix Society of Historical Swordsmanship in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I appreciate uh, Beth and Aiden inviting me to, to teach today. Um, I had a great time teaching last year at Sword Squatch. Uh, and I appreciate them giving me the idea to talk about cutting at home since we're in the middle of a pandemic and, and we can't gather as much. Uh, there are lots of things you can do to practice cutting at home. Um, I've, I've been practicing cutting at home for over eight years, so there, there are a lot of things you can do. Um, I have a presentation that I'll walk through, and I, I am really hoping that um, if there are people at home with uh, whatever, water bottles, uh, pumpkins, uh, watermelons, uh, if you have tatami mats, that's great, um, pool noodles, uh, we have pool noodles here. I have a little bit of everything that I'm going to talk about, so I can I can demonstrate some things if it's if it's needed. You can see behind me I have cutting stands, so I can just walk back there and, and do some cutting over here. I have I have pumpkins, I have uh, water bottles and 
cool noodles and I have some Thai mats in the in the cooler. Uh, so let me <clears throat> go ahead and share my presentation. <clears throat> Let me know, can you see that? Uh, yep, that is looking good, it looks full screen. All right, so yeah, the topic is is cutting at home. Um, if I can advance the slide here. So what I had planned was to, to go through this presentation and also have a couple of videos I put together quickly uh, yesterday uh, to demonstrate a few things so I'm not constantly getting up and demonstrating and sitting back down. Um, and then, yeah, if, if you guys want to do some cutting um, and have me watch and, and get pointers, or if you just want to want to cut and have fun, that's, that's what this is about today. Um, so let me start with, <clears throat> if, you, if you can't gather to in a group to practice cutting, uh, the minimum uh, required equipment really is just a blunt or a sharp sword that, that produces sword wind. Uh, audible feedback if you cut with your edge aligned with the direction of the cut. Um, I have a video demonstrating that, but essentially, you know, if you draw a line from the back edge to the front edge, if that, if, if your sword blade is, is traveling precisely in the direction of the cut, You'll hear that sword wind, uh, a loud whistle, as opposed to hearing nothing or maybe just a, a very uh, quiet whoosh sound. Uh, and that will tell you that your, your edge alignment is good. And if, if you practice that, then when you put a cutting target in front of you, <clears throat> you should be able to, and you're cutting with a, a nice sharp sword, you should be able to cut cleanly through the target because you're maintaining edge alignment. Uh, if your edge alignment is slightly off, say with this Tommy mat, the amount of force needed to go through, if you can even go through the target, increases dramatically. So having very good edge alignment is important to having a, a clean and uh, effective cut. Um, and the second bullet here, and this is, this is very, very helpful. If, if you're able to, to record yourself when you're cutting, um, it's extremely useful. And I'll show you uh, in a video uh, that I took yesterday uh, it's, it's, it's useful if you're not, if you feel that something's going wrong and you want to analyze what's wrong. Um, but it's also useful if it felt like everything went right, you can look and see maybe things that you didn't realize you were doing. Um, it, it can be every bit as useful. As long as you understand basically what you're trying to do, then it can be very useful. It could be like having, a, have, having someone help you with your cutting because Oftentimes, if I'm if I'm teaching, if I'm helping someone cut um, cut it to Tommy Matt, I'll watch them, and if they're having trouble, I'll I'll try to explain what I saw. Uh, but oftentimes, I'll have to walk over and get a blunt or something and and uh, mimic what I saw so that they can understand uh, how to adjust their movement they're making. Um, but if you have a camera, if you have a, a cell phone, and you record yourself, you can see it yourself and try and make the adjustment and watch it again. It's, you don't have to ever show it to anyone else, it's just for your, your own purposes. That's, that's why I started uh, recording my cutting about seven years ago. <clears throat> and and it's, it's been very, very helpful for me. So let me see if I can pull up that video. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> share this video. So if your cut is well aligned, you should hear 
a whoosh like that. And here I'm discuss or showing what I just discussed. That if if your blade's in line with the cut, you'll hear that. Here I purposefully turn my blade a few degrees off to the side. I'm holding it wrong, but you can hear there's there's no no sword wind. But when it's well aligned, and you have a sword that produces a decent amount of sword wind, you can hear sword wind. Now. As I mentioned before, in reviewing this video on the on the descending cut, the second descending cut from the left, I was dropping my shoulder a lot more than I I, I would tell my students not to do that. So I wasn't I didn't realize I was doing that. So watching this video helps me to analyze what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. And it's it's something. It took me all of uh, you know five minutes to record that. So it it, it was. Uh, very valuable. It can be very uh, valuable. Say, say, Phil, sorry to break in here. Um, yeah. It looks like the sound was off on that video. Uh, when you're uh, sharing your screen, yeah, you have to do the same thing I did. Uh, basically, excellent. in the share screen options, there's a uh, share computer sound, and then opti uh, right under share computer sound, there's a optimize something, something. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can do it again. Yes, I want to hear that yes. sword wind. That's right. It's <laughs> I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to hear it. Uh, let's see. All right. So, she, um, is it under more, or where does it say share computer sound? Uh, so once you actually share your screen, uh, I go ahead and share and then oh, pause okay. it, and then when gotcha. you go up to the um, basically the bar at the top, then add some, some options about sound and whatnot. That's what I had to do for the, uh, the purple heart thing. All right. So, so yeah, now, this, now there should be like a top. Bring this back to the beginning. Okay. I see, I see. Share computer sound. And then you say you do want to, uh, I do want to do the optimize or it's just. Uh, yeah. Now we should be able to hear it. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Let's try this again. Yep, we can hear it. So I'm going to rotate it, the grip in my hand, so I'm holding it at a <clears throat> at an odd angle, so it's not not aligned. And there's really no sound to that. So I think clearly you can do this indoors, you can do it outdoors, whatever the situation is. If you're indoors, of course, make sure not only do you have room to do it, but there's no chance of anyone walking into the space where you're practicing. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so let me go back to the presentation, I guess. Okay, can you see that? Um, it's doing that thing where it's showing us the uh, the full the thing on the sidebar. I think the way you, sh uh, you shared it earlier. Um, okay, let me try again.
And again, if you have any questions, please uh, please throw it in the chat. Use the uh, the Q and A feature. If you'd like to share your video, uh, if you're doing, if you're able to set up cutting today and get some feedback from Philip, um, let us know, and we can uh, we can get that going too. There we go. That looks good. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's if if you're, I tried to think about you know all of the different scenarios that people would have trying to practice cutting at home. So <clears throat> when I first started uh, cutting a little more than eight years ago, I was still living in an apartment. So <clears throat> that makes it limits what you can do, but you can still do a few things. Uh, the first thing that I was cutting indoors was, was pool noodles. You can cut pool noodles inside. Uh, it doesn't make a huge mess. And the pieces that go flying are just light pieces of foam. So not a huge deal. Um, and I, I made the comment here that definitely wherever you choose to cut, um, make sure that not only do you have room, but but that there's no chance that uh, your pet dog might walk in or someone might actually, you know, come through a door and have a bad day. So with pool noodles, uh, you can cut them indoors or outdoors. Um, they're there are a number of things you can do with them that are, are useful. Um, cutting pool noodles will be easiest with a, a, a very sharp sword. Sharp, not only shaving sharp, but having a, a fairly thin edge, a uh, fine edge. <clears throat> Basically, the more force needed to cut a pool noodle, the more likely it is just to, to flop over because it's, it's very uh, soft and flop over pretty easily. <clears throat> so if you do things like, um, uh, put a take a sharpie marker and put a, a mark on the on the pool noodle and aim for that spot and you can you can practice your accuracy um, and also it'll just increase your ability to to handle uh, a sharp sword and get used to the cutting safely with a sharp sword um, there are <clears throat> Okay, so you guys can see my presentation, but you can also see me talking. Uh, okay. Yep. Okay, so if I step aside for a second. There are uh, regular pool noodles that are about two and a half inches in diameter. Uh, this is what people usually cut. Um, and all the comments I just made earlier apply to that. There are also thicker pool noodles that are more like the diameter of a, of a tatami mat, more like three and a half or four inches. And um, these <clears throat> require more force. Um, but they're also, they're fun to cut if you have a nice sharp sword. Um, they're much less likely to flop over, but they, they can be tougher to cut. I remember when I first started cutting in the apartment, I was actually using a, uh, a differentially hardened katana and I, I, and I hadn't had any practice with this when I was first starting. And I managed to bend it on a pool noodle because these things are <laughs> tougher than they look, but they're fun to cut. Uh, if you have a, a good sturdy sword, uh, you can cut either side of the pool noodle. And like I say, if you put a, a mark on there, you can, you can work on your, your accuracy. Um, uh, to some extent, you can see the trajectory of the cut. If you have a good cut, whether or not it was at the angle that you want and so forth. That's an option that you can do indoors. If you don't have the ability to have a, a backyard or some other open space to cut in. Um, let's see. Yeah. So one thing that we did last year at the, uh, the cutting tournament at Sword Squats, we had rope cutting. Um, and really it's, it's, you can look at it sort of similar to what I just described with the pool noodles. The rope is not 
difficult to cut. It, I think it was it was rope like this, about a quarter inch thick rope, so it's not terribly difficult to cut. But it it's um, it helps you work on the accuracy and um, the speed of your cut. If you if you hang this from, I don't know if you can see. There's a heavy bag stand behind me. Um, that's what uh, uh, Matthew used. Uh, Matthew Roach during the, the cutting tournament last year. Uh, if you hang this and then put two pieces of, uh, let's say, electrical tape, make a target, and then try and aim for that target. And if, if this rope is just hanging, or if there's like a light weight on the bottom, just keeping it in place, you have to do a quick cut to be able to cut through or just push the rope aside. And uh, so you can test your accuracy while delivering a quick cut. <clears throat> and obviously this is it's just gonna produce little pieces of rope or, or some strands of rope. So you can, that's something you can do inside as well. Um, and there are other things I've seen people do, but I haven't done it myself. Um, hanging a newspaper from a coat hanger with, with uh, uh, clothespins and then cutting the paper, but uh, I haven't done that myself, so I can't really speak to it. Um, let's see. Now, if you have the ability to cut outdoors, then you know the number of possibilities increases quite a bit as far as cutting targets go. Um, if you have a back door or a backyard area or some open area to cut in, but you don't have a sharp sword. Um, as long as you have <clears throat> a blunt sword, um, let me grab one. So if you have a blunt sword, uh, this one, for example, is a, just a Hanway Tinker uh, single hand blunt. It's a couple of millimeters thick on the edge, rounded tip. Um, something like this will cut pumpkins and other large uh, squash and watermelons and other melons just fine. So if, if you don't have a sharp, uh, you can cut with 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 a blunt, and I actually have a a short video of that. I did a couple yesterday. Let me see if I can pull that up successfully. <clears throat> yeah, but we've got sound on. It sounds like. Oh, you heard it? Okay. Oh, and okay. Good stuff. Let's let it go then. <clears throat> so this is using that Conway Tinker Blunt. So it will cut. I guess I should put up air quotes cut because it doesn't have a sharp edge, but it will cut rings through a pumpkin. Um, if you have an unsharpened uh, windlass sword. A lot of those swords, you know, they, I don't think they can ship sharp swords from India to here, so they come unsharpened, and those cut pumpkins and watermelon really well, also. And watermelon, they're fun. <laughs> they explode once you cut them. A mess on the floor, but now in this video, I. Um, I used a, my cutting stand, let's see, I want to just close this video, let's see if I can do that. <clears throat> I 
Okay. So in that video, I used just the, the cutting stand that I used for tatami mats. Um, I don't cut fruit that often, so I don't. What will be better is a flat cutting stand uh, attachment or, or you know, just a flat surface to put the pumpkin or watermelon on. Because if you put it on a spike, then that limits the amount of what you can cut without hitting the stand. Um, it, it'll work for a few cuts, but it's better if you have a, um, a base to put the, the, the say, the pumpkin on. Um, <clears throat> and that brings up another good point that a safe stand is, is an important consideration when doing cutting. Um, uh, there are plenty of videos on YouTube of people injuring themselves, cutting in unsafe ways. I, I remember a video of someone cutting a watermelon, but I don't know if he just wants to secure it or what the deal was, but he put his hand on top of the watermelon and tried to cut it with a machete and just the, the rind of the watermelon caused it to come up and go right into his hand. And I saw another one. <clears throat> if you want to, I've seen videos, I know uh, there are probably some people on, on, I know there are people on this, on this, uh, this webinar that have done cutting where you launch the piece of fruit and someone cuts it. If you do that, be, be very careful to keep the sword in front of you when you're cutting. There's another video on YouTube of someone doing that for a while. And then I think they picked a, a cantaloupe or honeydew or whatever, tossed it up in the air and they had like a katana and they waited too long to swing and it dropped and they swung at it and hit their foot, the instep of their foot. And, cut tendons and everything else. So uh, be careful. Uh, my recommendation is use a safe cutting stand. Um, you know, my cutting stands are wooden. So if there's, a, there's, there's incidental contact, it happens. And so if you have a cutting stand with large pieces of metal exposed, you could damage your sword. So, <clears throat> and also break your sword, causing a dangerous situation with a broken piece of sword flying. So a wooden stand, as stable as you can get it, you know, for cutting is, is the safest way to go. And then, of course, if you have an outdoor area and a sharp sword, then you can do lots of stuff, lots of additional things. Um, you can cut all the previous targets and, I mean, fruit and so forth would be a lot easier to cut with a sharp sword. But, but like I say, almost sharp blunts, really thick, uh, like stage steel blunts with four millimeter thick edges or whatever, it's gonna be difficult. You're really gonna be just smashing the fruit. But as long as you have a relatively fine edge, you should be able to, to cut melons. But a sharp sword, you can cut rope, you can cut uh, pool noodles. <clears throat> you can also cut uh, various types of water bottles and of course, um, tatami mats. Um, I'll talk a little bit about water bottles, but I'll also mention that uh, if, you, if you're interested in, in getting the most out of cutting with water bottles, I know RJ McKeon at South Coast Swords and I think Jonathan Ying worked with them and they put together either a six or seven part series on, on cutting with water bottles and how to judge whether or not you cut them well. So, you know, if you're interested in, in, in really delving into that, there are like six or seven videos out there from, from RJ uh, at South Coast Swords. Um, but with water bottles, and I've cut a lot of water bottles in the past, um, you can do fun games with, with friends. If you're, again, if you're at home, can't get together, you can do, you can make a video of, of, of cutting water bottles in some certain way. And, and, and then uh, you, can, you can have a game of it. We, we, we had uh, what was called a game of swords. Uh, on this sword group that I belong to. And it was like a game of horse with basketball. Uh, you take a shot and the person has to either make the shot or they get an H and O and so on. And first person with horse spelled out is out. So same thing with sword. You could take two water bottles. Back over. 
of it and stack them and 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 say the feat is to do a double cut you know through the water bottles and if if you make it then the other people have to make it or they get an s and then if you do another one they don't get it they get a w and first person to sword or once you get to sword you're out of the game so things like that are fun to do and if you're doing things like that you can improve your your targeting uh the speed of 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 cuts accurately and very quickly delivering a cut and following up with another cut um and you could practice your targeting you could put marks on it where you want to hit or i mean i think part of one of rj's videos was okay aim for this part of the bottle because it's the most efficient place to cut it so you can work on your aim as well um water bottles are not particularly hard to cut in general but this is a dasani which is a pretty good consistency for water bottle for cutting some of the store-bought brands it was so soft you could almost twist it and end it and it's almost like a bag of water with a cap on it um those are very easy to cut these are slightly have slightly more rigidity so they're a little bit better to cut and there are soda bottles or two liter soda bottles <clears throat> and i think the toughest that i've come across are you know, 20 ounce gatorade bottles that are, are pretty tough to cut through if you if the other water bottles are, are become very easy to cut through, try try a twenty ounce Gatorade. They're pretty tough. So, um, and like I say, you can stack them for for multiple cut combinations. We had some where we were stacking them three bottles high. Uh, have you tried any while we're on while we're on bottles? I a, I was wondering if you've tried any. Uh, um, I saw somebody do some cutting that looked pretty good. Like they honestly got about, you know, I think they got about three cuts into this bottle and it was a, what was it? Uh, like an automotive fuel bottle. So it was, it seemed like pretty good thick plastic. Um, I was impressed because normally after that, you know, when I, when I cut on bottles, I get maybe definitely one cut, two cuts, almost never. Like the bottles already just so deteriorated. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. So if you if you use um, bottles like that with stiffer plastic, you can get certainly get more. Cuts. If you use um, milk jugs, you can get a ton of cuts off of it because you still got that. As long as you're cutting near the top, you still got a large volume of water holding in place. Um, lighter water bottles, it's more difficult to do. But now, as you mentioned that, we did have some feats where you cut. You do a rising cut, which would knock the upper part into the air, and then your descending cut would need to sever the airborne part. So there, yeah, there are lots of things you can do, and and yeah, thicker um, detergent bottles, uh, like you say, bottles for oil or bottles for um, that sort of thing, <clears throat> have with the thicker walls you can get more customs for sure. Yeah. Nice, thank you. So the let's see, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, <clears throat> the Tommy mats. Um, of course, if you have the ability to to cut the Tommy mats, it'll it'll give you the best feedback on whether or not your cut was a good quality cut. It's going to require the most effort. It's going to cost the most. <clears throat> You're going to need equipment or need you know, a, 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 a container to soak mats in and, and space to drain the mats. Um, but if you, if you go to that trouble, the, the feedback is really, really good. Uh, tatami is just about, it's, the reason we use it in tournaments is it's pretty much the best um, tool for, for gauging uh, the quality of your cuts that, that we have because it's, 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 you're cutting a bunch of individual stalks. And so each, so every little bit of the cut will be recorded in the, in, you know, the, in, in, in the, the, the length of the, 
the um, the fibers. So if you if your cut turns at all, you will be able to see it in the cut. Also, the the tatami mats are nice uh, dense uh, cutting material. <clears throat> and what other nice thing is is the mats will also test whether or not you have a good a good grip on your sword because tatami mats are, are constantly trying to turn your blade. Um, the blade's trying to follow the path of least resistance, and that path is just straight down. You could have a big, thick roll of tatami mats and just cut all the way down to the cutting stand with one cut because you're not cutting into the fibers. You're just cutting basically the little white uh, cotton string that's holding the mats together. <clears throat> Whereas if you try to horizontal cut on a big, say, four mat roll or something, it'd be very, very difficult. So if you're cutting at a 45 degree angle, the mats will try to pull it down, or if you're cutting up, it'll try and pull the sword up. So it's, it's very useful also in, in determining if you've formed a good grip uh, on the sword. Um, let's see. So yeah, and unfortunately, especially now with the tariffs, you know, the trade with China, price of time mats is, is going up pretty consistently. For me, it's up to about $9 a mat now. Um, so there's the mats and then rubber bands to secure them and a container to soak the mats. Um, I put a link here and I also, I don't know if we have a way to share this PowerPoint presentation, but um, I put the actual plans in here for the stand that I'm using. Um, and then there are variations on it. Here's the directions. Um, there are variations on <clears throat> on this stand that can be, for example, um, I have two stands behind me. One of them, if I can minimize this. Uh, if you go to, uh, if you stop sharing, then it'll, it'll maximize your, your video again. Okay. So the two cutting stands behind me, the one closest to me, I, I changed the, um, the design by just using instead of four by six legs, I use two by six and that makes it a lot lighter and easier to move around. Uh, the four by six legs are very, very, it gives a very sturdy base. So if you're, if you're cutting, you know, a bunch of bats rolled together, <clears throat> it'll give a, a a very solid base, and that's I think that's why the person who designed this designed it that way. Um, James Williams, he liked to cut six or eight of the mats <clears throat> rolled together. They were Wara, or um, a little bit softer than than the Tommy mats we use, so it's not as difficult, but it's still it's a heavy target, so he had a big base put on it. Uh, if you want to make your own that's not quite as as complicated, but won't last quite as long, you just use wood screws to attach um, two by six or two by fours to a, a uh, four by four post like this. Um, but another nice feature of, and if you follow this link that I put on the a slide above. <clears throat> That's a link to the to a post on the um, HEMA cutting discussion group Facebook group where I posted this these cutting plans as well as how I uh, turn this into a, a triple mat cutting stand because with this very heavy base if I then put um, <laughs> I then bolt on two more uprights, then you can turn it into a triple mat stand to cut two or three mats at the same time. So it's a versatile uh, stand, but you can find other cutting stand uh, ideas online. Also, when I first started 
And if, I mean, again, so if you're, if you're in an apartment, let's say, and you don't have woodworking tools, you can't, and I, I don't, I, I just use a handsaw, handheld drill, and that's pretty much it. Sandpaper, I mean, to put those together. I let uh, Home Depot do the, the major cutting to get it all to the right size when I buy it. But uh, if you don't want to do that, there are uh, online uh, shops and so forth that sell pre-made stands. And that's what I started with. Um, out of 40 or 50 bucks, you can buy one that you can use for pool noodles. Um, if you don't want to have to build your own cutting stand. And that, I believe. Nice. So we can probably, uh, what we can do is basically this, this video is going to go up on Facebook and up on YouTube. And basically in the, uh, in the comments or in the description, we'll try to, we'll include a link uh, to those, to those plans. Now I know the HEMA cutting discussion group, a uh, great Facebook group, by the way, if you do cutting um, to join, you have to send RJ a video of you cutting. We, they don't, uh, they don't waste any time. So, um, but it, you, it can be cutting a water bottle. It can be cutting anything. Um, it's basically a very low barrier of entry just to, you know, keep the, keep the group cutting focused and whatnot. That's, that's right. And uh, you don't have to, he's not going to judge you on it. You don't, it's just everyone who joins, if you want to post now you can just go there and view it, view the plans. It's, a, it's an open public group, I believe. As a member, I can confirm that you do not need to have a pretty video of you cutting. <laughs> yes, but I think people who are not even members, in fact, I know because I've sent links to other people. So you don't have to be a member to see what I have in oh, that perfect. post. Awesome. You can't comment, you can't post things yourself, but you can see what's there. So anybody can go in and see it. But yeah, if you want to join, uh, you just send them a video and it doesn't, like you say, it doesn't have to be anything special. Just cut a water bottle and you're in. That's it. So, all right. Well, have you, uh, Aiden, have you received any uh, requests to share video? Um, not yet. And again, if you are, if you are able to set up some cutting today and you want to get some feedback from Philip, um, we got plenty of time for that. Don't be shy, ask in the chat, ask in the Q&A. Um, I've got a few questions while we're, uh, while awesome. we're waiting for that. Um, one thing that I've heard some people cutting as just sort of a simple medium, uh, especially for beginners, is clay. Have you messed around with cutting clay? I have not. Uh, I've been at my cutting tournament last year, January 2019, RJ brought some. I didn't get around to cutting it though. I've seen it cut. Um, I was at the 2017 Long Point when they cut clay as well. Um, it's it's an interesting medium for sure. Uh, some things that I picked up, for example, from Long Point, they didn't let you cut with your own sword. I mean, if you have a nice sharp sword, you probably don't want to use that for cutting clay because it can it puts a lot of stress on the sword. <clears throat> it can also wear down the edge and so forth. So. At, um, at Long Point, they used a uh, uh, heavy duty Dell 10, uh, somewhat overbuilt uh, sword that could withstand the stress. It didn't have a sharp edge, I don't believe. It doesn't need it. <clears throat> but yeah, clay is, is another, uh, because clay, you can use it and then reuse it and reuse it. You know, it, it, it's, it, doesn't, get, uh, it doesn't wear out really, as long as you keep it as long as the type that doesn't dry out really quickly, you can keep using it. Um, as I understand it, to have a um, to have it be a real challenge, it needs you need to have quite a bit of it. Or, or a, the number I heard was, I think, two hundred pounds, or uh, somewhere in that range to to, to have a really um, challenging cut. But it, and if you're if you're just using a smaller amount, you should it'll cut through very easily. Uh, but you can certainly judge your <clears throat> your edge angle um, cutting with clay. I haven't done it personally though. Nice. Um, still no questions or or video things, and it may be because the uh, there's some air quality issues uh, on the on the west coast at least, um, and even apparently some of that's reaching out on the east coast. So. 
uh, I know I was planning to, uh, I was planning to set up a stand and do some cutting, but I woke up and out the outside was orange in Seattle today. So I said, mm, probably not. Um, but I've still got questions because, you know, I, I always got questions. Um, so I know you do some, uh, you do some Japanese sword art cutting. Um, I've seen you do some katana uh, testing. Um, and yeah. did you do some wakazashi cutting, I want to say? I did. I did. I like, I like cutting with single hand swords. So <clears throat> I wanted to try cutting with a wakazashi. Uh, what I like is I haven't had formal training other than a friend of mine is a, is a I think a second degree black belt. Um, and he showed me some of the ways to draw the sword uh, and sheathe it properly. Um, and just how to how to wear the hakama and all the rest of the stuff, but I haven't had any training on cutting. I, I've just just practiced a lot, and that's that's pretty much the, the, how it is for for all of the cutting that I do. I just I just practiced a lot, and <clears throat> tournaments have been very helpful because they you go in knowing what they're going to be judging, so you, you work on trying to improve. So I I, I like um, I enjoy cutting uh, using the, the Japanese curriculum because they have a curriculum. They have a set of defined cuts. Um, and yeah, I, I recently did uh, a wakazashi cutting. Um, I could put that up if someone wanted to see it. it it's a few minutes long. Sure. I'm just, it uh, looks like somebody on Facebook is, is, uh, is trying to share a video. So I'm, I'm just giving them the link. Um, okay. Awesome. Love to see it. All right, let me yeah, see. get this to work. While you're bringing that up, that actually uh, mentioning the draw, uh, the drawing actually uh, remind me of something, which is um, I recently picked up a Yato, which is basically a, a dull uh, katana used for practicing uh, drawing. Mm -hmm. Is that is that something that you could use on like you know fruit and watermelon and clay, like you were doing with the uh, the Hanway tinkers and whatnot? It depends on what it's made of. <clears throat> Um, I have a Yaito that is made of, uh, of steel, um, carbon steel, I believe. So if you have one that's made of, of, of a material that would stand up to cutting, then yeah, it would work. <clears throat> but sometimes if you buy Yaitos, they're made of something other than steel. Uh, sometimes, um, an alloy, a lightweight alloy, and I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how how durable those would be. They're not meant to cut fruit. So, if you have an Eido that's that's made of steel uh, and they can stand up to the cutting, then sure, it, it should be able to. The edge shouldn't be super thick. I wouldn't think it should be a, comparable to this edge on this army sword, for example. Nice. And I see, uh, so I believe Amber just joined. Um, Amber, did you want to share video? Go ahead and post in the, uh, the chat and I'll upgrade you. Um, and while I'm waiting for that, we have a question from Tobias. Uh, do you have examples of different blade geometries and what we could be looking for in a good cutting blade? What are the pros and cons of different blade geometries? Nice so, advice. yeah. Appreciate that. So if, uh, depending on what you're cutting, so I've covered a lot of different cutting targets in the presentation. <clears throat> if you're cutting water bottles, um, a sharp edge is the main thing you need because it's just, it's a thin layer of plastic. Um, <clears throat> I made a video recently about the different types of, or what can be meant when you say something is sharp. Excuse me. 
you can have, there are two measures. Optimally, you'll, you want both of them, but you can look at them distinctly. One is how polished the edge is. So if you polish the edge to the point where you can shave hairs off your arm, <clears throat> and then that's one measure of sharpness. But you can you can polish a pretty thick edge to the point that it's 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 shaving sharp. But if you try and cut, let's say a tatami mat, <clears throat> or as we talked about a pool noodle, and it's a thick, fat edge rather than a, a thinner edge, then you're likely to just push the the noodle over, um, or have a lot of difficulty cutting through a tatami mat. So you can have sharpness uh, on, a, on, a, on a very thick edge that, that doesn't cut through a dense target very well. Conversely, you can have uh, a blade that has a very fine edge, but, but that final cutting edge is not polished. It could be like just sort of butter knife sharp. But leading up to that edge is a very uh, fine edge. And with a sword like that, uh, you, can, you can cut it to Tommy Matt. Uh, I have a video, like on that video, I have a, a long, uh, quite a while ago, probably six years ago, I bought a sword as one of my first um, better uh, quality um, European type swords. It was a Christian Fletcher Border Watch. And when I received it, and I think it uses an Albion blade, uh, Chris Fletcher used an Albion blade to make those. It's sort of based off of the uh, Strider sword from Lord of the Rings. I know exactly the sword you mean. That is yeah. a that's a nice sword. And looks like we looks like we have Amber on camera. Oh, great. So we have let me uh, let me spotlight their video here. Hello, Amber. Welcome to the stream. Hi. What would you like to uh, work on with Philip? So. little DJ from Ashanti over in New York. Uh, he basically said, hey, like, do you have a sharp? And I was like, nope. And he's like, do you want one? And I was like, yeah, like, so he right. sent me this one. Um, I believe it's the Hanway Bastard Sword. It's not anything super special or anything, um, but it is a sharp. And I've been working on just doing a uh, basic like Zorn cuts with it, with the water bottles and that kind of thing. Um, and I figured, well, if nobody else is like willing to like get out there and cut, I'll make a fool of myself and get out there and cut some water bottles. So, yay! <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to see it. <clears throat> By the way, the the Hanway Tinker Bastard Sword is one that I've used a bit and sharpened for some of my students. It's it's a good sword. It's a really, I mean, I I really like it. Um, as far as a, I definitely would recommend it as a. Uh, a really great uh, even keeled beginner sharp for sure um, just because it's it's pretty well balanced um, you don't need to know I guess like a lot of advanced technique to really get a good quality cut out of it um, but it'll also allow you to kind of get to that point where like you're understanding your um, your physics so that yeah. way you are able to make a better a better cut you know sure. even and then when you decide to graduate and get a big fancy $1,100 sword or whatever, then you can, but. Right, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so if y'all want, I can cut a water bottle and y'all can tell me if the distance is okay and whatnot and go from there. Sounds good, sounds good. Let's do it. So all I have is um, this sweet little four by four that's um, been uh, I guess it's just in the ground. Um, it was here when I moved in, so it seemed it's 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 not the best height. Uh, it could probably be about four or five inches taller, honestly. Yeah. Um, but it works. Awesome. I don't know if y'all can. Yeah, that's a nice, seems like a fairly sharp sword. Did you, 
Did someone sharpen it for you or? Um, Ashanti said that he sharpened it. Um, okay. I haven't touched it since I got it. Okay. Um, but I've been having some issues. Let me go put this in. So my biggest issues on, that I've been working through is that I was I was having an issue with it scooping right in the middle, which yeah. suggested that in my in my midway through the cut that I was pulling the cut in. And um, Josh Verrett is one of the people that I hang out all the time, and he basically teaches me um, a lot of the sword stuff. Anyway. Um, he suggested that the reason I was doing that scoop in the middle so hard is because I was so, I'm so used to swinging with the longer fetters. So like I have a Reginye, I think it's around 52 inches. And in order to keep it, the point from necessarily hitting the ground when I do exactly. swing through, I have to pull it up a little bit. Exactly. And with the shorter sharp, you don't have to do that because it's not going to hit the ground if you swing at a precise motion. And uh, kind of understanding that has really cleaned up my my edge. Um, but as a nice. shorter fencer, I didn't realize I was doing that until I started cutting the water bottles. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And and when you do start cutting the time, have you cut tatami mats? I have cut tatami mats, but okay. only in competition. So um, bro, twenty eighteen, and then um, SoCal in January, um, I've cut to Tommy mats then. Um, but that is, uh, my only experience in like professional okay. cutting. Good. So you were at SoCal. I was there as well. Yeah. Awesome. So <clears throat> yeah, when, when you cut to Tommy mats, often you see that as well. When people get, especially when they get lower on the mat, they start adjusting their swing. So they don't either hit the ground. Right. Or stand. So yeah, so that's good that, that Josh gave some pointers on, on, uh, keeping the edge alignment all the way through the cutting plane and not, not turning right. in the middle. Yeah. Well, and, and two, so like in the very beginning, I don't know if you can see just the minuteness about this cut, um, but I'm still trying to refine that, that edge as it comes off the shoulder and coming down through it because uh, I've had some just issues of getting it coming down at a proper angle. Yeah. Because what'll happen is it'll come off straight and then go down at that proper angle instead of just right. coming that proper angle all the way through. So um, my my advice and what I tell my students is, if you're doing that, if you're bringing it from 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 Vomtag out, bring it out fully before you get to the target. If your right. your cutting motion in, involves bringing it forward to the target, then you're going to have edge alignment problems. And right. I see and so what I say is usually, okay, just adjust your, your sights a little bit, right. it, uh, you know, five or six inches before the target so that you're then cutting in a nice, yeah. Arc. Yeah. yeah, my, my main issue on that has been understanding that communication that the hands leave first and then the body, right? So that making sure that that, that step is a fluid motion after the after the hands start to leave because the Absolutely. hands have to leave. So it, it's just about like being taught how to do swords wrong twenty times in the six years I've been doing this, and now understanding, okay, no, your body mechanics are a very crucial aspect to this, and that wasn't necessarily taught to me in the beginning. It was just swing the sword, get the point online, do the thing, and um, in the last couple years understanding the body mechanics and that kind of thing has been a really um, important thing, especially for me as a smaller fencer, because I, like if I were to fight a bigger person, my body mechanics have to be on point or I'm going to get smashed. Um, so like if my body mechanics are on point, I can go up to just about anybody block and get my point online and, and get where I need to go. So. Yep. That's good. That's your, your, Josh is telling the right things. And um, when, when I teach, often we do a lot of Fiore at the Fame Society. And so it seems like in new cutters, when they come in, they always want to cut from woman's guard with a sword. Yeah. Back. And 
if you do that technique, there are several steps before you actually deliver the cut, right? You right. Do a step with your, your left foot, and then you change the angle of the cut. And right. so if you start turning your hips, engaging your core, when you first start moving the sword, it's going to be ugly, right? Just like right. you lead with the, with the hands, get it out there, then engage your core and cut. Right. And that's something that I've, um, I've uh, interacted with with a lot of bigger guys, for instance, because they tend to want to generate all their energy from their upper body. They don't tend to want to use their hips and their feet to generate the, the, the power through um, because it's just that, that natural um, thing of using that brute force that naturally a lot of bigger guys or even bigger people have. Um, and that can really bite you in the ass when it comes to cutting, for sure, because you're not using that proper dynamic. You're actually using way more energy than it takes to really even just get it through the object. Yep. Yeah, I've worked with one particular very, very strong guy who uh, he would power through his overhouse. And then when I asked him to do a, an underhow, he would actually bend over so he could try and muscle through an underhow. Yeah. It's important to teach them to use their core, not their well, arm. And, and that'll also affect um, motions that also go into other motions. Because if you're overpowering that that first zorn, you can't come back and rotate back around to get into different guards because you've already kind of swung way too far out to bring it back in. So having that control to just really get to the point and get to that aspect you're using less energy and you're more precise as well. You're saying all the right things. That that's that's something that I've been uh, recently trying to teach some of my students who are pretty good. At my student Scott, who won the the gold in the open uh, cutting tournament at SoCal, sometimes when he's doing uh, a double cut, so he's trying to just quickly chain together movements, he'll almost spin himself around in a circle because he puts way too much power into the but cut. Well, because he's driving, you know, and then the question comes, well, where is he driving that initial cut from? If he's driving that initial cut just from his upper body and not using his, you know, his torso or just using that twist of the feet, right, just to, to get to that point, then the rest of the body can't follow that follow-up movement because you haven't set the spring, right? So you haven't set the spring to move forward. So therefore the body just wants to keep moving in the direction you've told it to move and it can't go into the other direction. That's where like, um, just like that twist of the foot for like, uh, so like swinging and then twisting the foot this way to generate that motion to go this way in that cut versus just cutting and then moving forward. It all kind of depends on, I guess the type of cut you would be going after too. It's all situational, right? Right, right. And so in general, if you focus on not using a lot of power before and after the cut and just engage your core during the cut, then no matter what you're doing after, if you have to react quickly, you won't yeah. have much energy pulling you in this direction. Or that right. direction. And, that's, and when you see people cut fluidly and it's all just so ebb and flow right and that's because they're they're understanding that that use of the power and when to pull the power and when to engage those particular muscles and i think it's you know you get in the hippie the hippie stuff right of the like the flow of the energy and the circles and all of that but it's all very a very crucial understanding when you're coming to the aspect of connecting multiple pieces together in order to create a continuous fluid method method yeah you've, you've you've obviously put a lot of thought in this because you're saying a lot of things that i i think as well i studied uh japanese and chinese martial arts for about 10 years before i came to hema and yeah there's a lot of talk about either ki in japanese or chi in chinese i always yeah. look at it as a way of of communicating something very very complicated without having to use a thousand words. If you can right. visualize the energy coming from your core out to your extremities, then you don't have to go into a lot of detail about, okay, tense muscles and tense those muscles, and okay, now release your core and do this. If, if you imagine the flow of energy, that that, that, that that gives you a method of explaining something that's kind right. of physically. 
Well, and I think a really good example that a lot of people could key on of that that flow of energy is when you meet somebody in a bind and you you dump them off that bind to come back around. That instance of dumping them off that bind and coming back around, you've now taken their energy and used it to your advantage to increase your speed without having to do very much energy for your own self. So that I think that's a really good relatable term to people who just may not have an idea of where to start to understand that that particular concept and it's it's something you only get with experience and time and insight and it's hard to kind of like throw at people <laughs> yeah definitely yeah well, excellent um amber are there any cuts that uh you find particularly challenging that you want to get some feedback on so far, we haven't had anybody ask to jump on, so it's all you. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. Well, apparently, I'm the star of the show right now. Um, um, I haven't been playing with a whole lot of different cuts just because um, a lot of the more difficult cuts, like short edge and that kind of thing, um, with this particular setup, because it is a little wonky, I'm kind of hesitant to go about a lot of those cuts because the bottle isn't sitting quite right. It's not quite the right height. And I don't, I don't want to goof something up and do something dumb. Um, but like I've had more challenges and, and I'm sure this is true with a lot of other people too, but it's a really odd concept that I am more true on the left side a lot of the times than I am from the right side because I'm so used to doing the right side that the left side's like, oh, you've taught me these lessons. I've learned it. But the right side's like, uh-uh, I learned this wrong. Like over here, I'm going to do it whatever way I want to. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really a funny, um, a funny thing. Like I can throw an unter from the left side and have almost a perfect cut. I come from that right side and it's all the bottles across the yard. I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> that's, that's definitely true. And if you, if you practice uh, arts where you're potentially holding a single hand weapon in either hand, like I, I also trained in um, uh, Filipino martial arts for a while while I was training him because one of our guys also ran uh, a FMA school. And so I had, and I still have a couple of Filipino weapons and I find that when I go to cut with my left hand, well, I would, I would do cutting in this end to him and say, wow, your cuts with your left hand are much better with your right. And it's exactly the same thing. I, I've been told what to do. I know what to do. I don't have bad habits with left hand, but I just do it. And then I've got all sorts of bad muscle memory in the right hand. Yeah, so it comes back to that concept we were talking about before about the ebb and the flow and just understanding the flow of the energy, right? Where you know, the left hand's just going with whatever you're kind of telling it to do with it, right? It's like, um, no, I think I'm going to go over here. And it's like, no, you just need to go here because it's it's something that your brain has kind of gotten used to, like, one, two, three, four, you go in this method, and that's not always um, the best thought process, you know? Um, it's complicated. For such a simple thing it's it's extremely complicated and I think once you get into like um the levels that I think a lot of people are, are starting to get to with how HEMA is developing and how um, schools are developing and teaching styles and and access to resources and that kind of thing it, it's getting to a point where like it's an evolution of all you know but it all goes together so understanding that concepts from other martial arts also are an influence and understanding on just say for cutting for instance you know and understanding those body mechanics are just like understanding boxing mechanics you know that that just that energy to get to the point to get that first right right yeah a frog dna i guess you call it yeah. martial arts yeah <laughs> All right. What was right? Go ahead. Um, let's see. I was just looking. Do, do, do you? We had some other people join, so I just reposted my uh, my reminder. If, if you want any feedback direct from Phil, um, 
we can we can throw your camera up and you can cut some stuff and it'll either you know give you admonishment or praise we'll see um i had a, a couple of questions while we're waiting for anybody to uh to speak up um you mentioned uh soaking to tommy mats and this is something that we always have trouble with uh what do you recommend for use as a container for soaking to tommy mats so i've been given that a lot of thought recently actually because i'll be doing the we run the cutting tournaments at, at combat con i was supposed to do it this year but of course it didn't happen but it's only next year and what we have used what they have used in the past and i actually have one here is a big uh storage bin uh the interior dimensions are like 38 or 39 inches long and uh they can hold gosh probably 30 35 mats um if in and one particular model is pretty sturdy. Um, for me, I, I cut all the time, so I actually have a a, a a cooler, like when you take on a fishing boat to keep fish cool a bit, so it's a big one, uh, and I can drain the water from it once they're soaked. But um, one thing that I've been looking into and will probably use at Combat Con are the the, the tall uh, blue barrels. Um, if those of you who were at SoCal Sword Fight would have seen RJ use those. So they're just a little bit taller than the tatami mat rolled up. And you can, you put the mats in vertically, fill it up, and then clamp the lid down. And those work, those, those can work well, and particularly in an environment where you're having to store mats and want to keep them damp for a long time. Uh, having them standing up in the water they can constantly wick the water. And so if you, when you drain them, put them back up, they'll still drain a little water into the bottom and be able to wick that water back up and, and stay moist. So um, those blue barrels are nice. I, I haven't played with them yet. I know RJ loves them and he's gonna, he was gonna bring some for us to borrow and then I was gonna buy maybe a, a couple or combat cotton would buy a couple. So that's another option. Something I'll, I'll probably get one just to try it out. But right now I'm using like if you go to Home Depot, the largest size bin, they're like they're black bins about this big and this big and usually with a bright yellow top. Um, and they work really well. Um, the, the consideration there is that once you have the mats in there and you start filling with water, it's, it becomes very, very heavy, you know, full of water. So if you buy a, a um, sort of flimsy container, um, it, it can buckle and, and or, or, you know, we bought some, some black bins from Walmart, I think, and they were uh, thinner plastic. We used them at uh, Valley of the Sun County tournaments last year. Uh, and they, they're good for just maybe, maybe three, four, five soakings, and they start to crack and break and fall apart because they're just not made to hold that much water. Um, so, um, there's, there's the heavy duty black ones from, from Home Depot. There's a, you know, a water cooler like that will cost the most, it will cost like 120 or whatever, but it'll, I've, I've, I've used one for five, six years, just clean it every now and then to keep it from getting too nasty. And it's, it's easy. You load it up, soak the mats, then undo the drain plug, let it drain out and, and it's good to go. So those, those are some of the options soaking. I also know some people just use a big a big container like a, you'd use for like a horse trough or whatever and just put the you know made out of galvanized steel or maybe out of heavy plastic and put the mats in there and then stack cinder blocks or whatever on top to hold it down while it soaks. That's that's another option but it's messier and um, probably also limits the number of mats you can soak at one time. Uh, because of, of the buoyancy and you'd have to have a lot of heavy weight holding it down. Nice. Yeah, we always, every every year at Sword Squatch, we basically figured out a different way to soak mats. Um, I think RJ has found a good solution with those, those huge, you know, farm troughs, big old steel tubs. Um, but, you know, we always, uh, always looking for, for new ways to do that. Um, let's see, any, any questions from the stream? Anybody who wants to share their video to do some 
uh, to get some feedback, let us know in Q and A. Let us look into the uh, uh, in the in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I got I got more questions. Um, let's see. And actually, you know what? I'm going to share my video for a second because I noticed that um, when we had Amber on, they were using a uh, Hanway Tinker Bastard, and I have the the same sword with some fancy stuff done to it. I 3D printed a wasted grip and put a different thing on it, but um, also lucky enough that I live uh, right near Michael Tinker Pierce, and he actually sharpened this sucker up for me. So this has got a this has got an edge from the the man himself. It's a decent. It's a little little short on the grip, but it's not bad for a starter. Um, did the exact same thing with the Hanway Tinker long sword. Um, again, lots of customization going on. Got it sharpened by Mike. Always good time. Um, but yeah, when it comes to when it comes to those sort of budget cutting swords, what's kind of like your your go to or favorite? I know that um, Hanway Tinker comes up a lot. Uh, Cold Steel comes up a lot. Are there any other brands, or do you have, you know, a good a good starting cutter? Well, yeah, my first sword that I used in competitions was a uh, Cold Steel and a half, and I, I won my first uh, bronze medal, my first medal with that sword at Combat Con. Um, it's a good sword. Uh, the only issue, it usually comes very sharp. You don't have to have someone sharpen it for you. <clears throat> but uh, one issue is when you're buying swords at that price point, the quality control can sometimes not be so great. So you get, you might get one that's perfect, like mine. I've used it. It's still good. I still use it sometimes at the club uh, for people to, to cut with after, gosh, I got that from, I guess he bought that from RJ in January of 2000 six so it's been four and a half years <clears throat> it's still going strong um the hanway tinker can work well if you uh if you put time into sharpening i've never had one that really cut well out of the box um most of them have really done the best after i've gone to trouble not only using the <clears throat> belt sander but doing some hand sanding to to refine the edge as i was as i was mentioned before you can have edge sharpness polished to where you can shave hairs off your arm but if the edge is too fat <clears throat> it's gonna have trouble cutting through the time at so so hand sanding with a, a sandpaper wrapped around a large metal file <clears throat> that will help uh, maintain the bevel exactly where you want it because the file won't flex. If you use a rubber sanding block, it'll flex to, to it'll bend on, on the blade when you're pushing down. And even a piece of uh, wood, if you're really bearing down on hardened steel, will deform. So if you want to keep that, that edge bevel right where you want it to be, wrap sandpaper around a, a, a metal file and use that to, to bring it down. And that's the best, uh, outcomes with Hanway Tinker uh, blades that I've had. I've, I've gone to the trouble of hand sanding as well. Um, Valiant Armory used to be <clears throat> a place to go, and I, I, I guess sometimes they have some of their older models in stock. It seems like right now they're focusing on their handmade swords that they do in-house, which they charge as much as Albion's or Atrium's or arms and armor. But if they have uh, swords in stock, some of those are good. Um, <clears throat> I won the advanced single hand cutting tournament at SoCal this past February using a Valiant Armory Monarch. Um, so uh, uh, and it, it cost me maybe 500, 550, something like that. So sort of mid range, um, but half the price of an Albion. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I, I, you know, um, uh, Purple Heart Armory, uh, Natasha, they have cutting swords from, uh, VB cutting swords that 
I, I don't know if you still have the site up, but I think they're 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 affordable as well, like maybe four hundred dollar range, something like that. They're competition cutting swords. Uh, it seems like there are, are other people trying to. I know, I know, Cold Steel just came out with something they're calling their competition cutting sword for maybe three hundred dollars. <throat> um, we'll see how how well that one cuts. It looks like a um, very similar to the Al or the uh, the windless Arbato, um, with just longer handle because Arbato has a really short handle. Nice. And yeah, I do. I did just bring up the uh, the Purple Heart uh, page. This is a good time to remind everybody that they're doing a ten percent discount from nine a.m. Pacific time to nine p.m. Pacific time today. So lots of time to shop on Purple Heart. And it looks like yeah, they've got a competition uh, sharp for three fifty, which is Again, for uh, for an entry level sharp, that's pretty good. That's uh, I think that's that's a little pricier than a, a Hanway or a Cold Steel, but I think the the quality you're going to get out of that is and the the sharpness of the blade. Uh, guessing that's going to be better out of the box for sure. Yeah, and and Vitas has been sending one of those as loaners at uh, at various competitions. I know there was one. There was one at SoCal Sword Fight, maybe not this year, but the year before. And some people used it. Uh, I think somebody won a medal with it. I have to go back and check. Uh, but uh, yeah, there. That's it's a lot of sword for that that much money. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, and I know that Albion does have. Uh, they have that that one line of slightly cheaper swords um but they're still you know yeah. i don't know yeah, what those are called yeah Caroline, uh, they have like a a great sword of war and they have a um yeah those are the ones and then they have a type 15 really it tapers down to a really distinct point um and yeah those i i i don't know that you would get those any faster than another albion though if they have them in stock at a table somewhere and you can just buy it, but otherwise, you know, the, the wait times. Yeah, and just a quick look, those are still around 600. So getting right. away from the entry level uh, pricing, but yeah, yeah. Um, I was just trying to think of some other uh, weird, well, not even weird, but just, you know, uh, brands that have been coming out selling, uh, selling European swords. I remember- yeah, I One of my students brought in a couple by, uh, by Ronan Katana. So they, that they, is exactly who I was going to bring up next. <laughs> yeah, they, they mostly are, they focus on Japanese swords, but they have a European line. Um, they have a variety of different swords. I want to say they even have a, 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 a like a Swiss saber or a you know, European saber, a two-handed saber. So yeah, they have, they have a, a line. I think they might have a Viking sword as well. So yeah. Oh yeah, I, I just popped over to their site and I do see they have a kind of Saber Kriegmesser looking thing. Um, right. Now my brother has one of these and I will definitely say nah, the sharpness out of the box, nah, not, not great. Um, the, the handle wrapping was really what got me on those. I am not a fan of their, their grip wrapping, um, mm -hmm. but we'll see what the, we'll see how those, how those go. It'd be, I like, you know, I'm just always interested in having a competitive market for, uh, for good old sharp, sharp swords. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, that guy not only spent a lot of time sharpening the blade, he also rewrapped the handle on both of his. He's he's really into. He's also you know uh, inserts coins and so forth or decorations in the if the pommel has a an opening. So he's he's into you know redoing and decorating his sword. So he redid that the grip. Awesome. Checking the. Uh, now on the other side of the spectrum, what's sort of your go-to for, you know, if you had, if you, if there, if money was no object, let's say, um, what are some of your favorite sharps on the other side of the spectrum? So say you've been cutting for a, a while and you're ready to get, you know, a super nice sharp that you've been saving up for, take her away. Yeah, I mean, um, I use a variety of swords and used that cold steel and cutting competition and tried other things. As soon as I picked up Gus's um, Atrium 
16A.4 and cut with it. He had, he had sent me two swords just to evaluate. They were both shop loaners and had, I think, been loaned out before. And as soon as I cut with that thing, I said, hey, Gus, can I, can I buy this from you? I think he gave me a discount because it was used, but it cuts just amazingly well. And I, I know there are a lot of people who, who use the 16A.4 as well. Um, I could certainly recommend that. Um, and it's not, it's not any particular uh, build or <laughs> there you go, there it is. So uh, I like I it. I had to get one of these too, yep. I like it. Um, Eric Hardeman, you know Eric Hardeman? He's like six, seven, I don't know, He's really, really tall. He likes his. Uh, Brittany Reeves has one. She won the bronze uh, at uh, Sword Squatch last year. She has one and likes it. So it's, it, it can be <laughs> any, it, it's not uh, any particular uh, size or, or, you know, build a person. It seems like everyone that I've let cut with it likes it. Now, some people really like their, you know, Principes or their um, Alexandrias with the really wide, really thin uh, cutting edge, and they cut well. There's, there's no doubt about that. <clears throat> but they're also about a pound heavier. Uh, and so I, I, I have a, I actually have an Alexandria. I like it. Um, but in competition, I've, I've basically found the sword for long sword cutting. I, I, I'm not looking anymore. You know, it, 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 it I could take that sword in any competition and feel, you know, confident with it. Um, arming swords, I'm still, still, see with arming swords, with single hand swords, it sort of becomes more um, specialized. I want to have one that's good for everything. And when I really started racking my brain last year, getting ready for this year's SoCal sword fight, because I knew that RJ was going to have a single hand cutting competition for any single hand sword. So you could bring an army sword, you could bring a messer, you could bring a, a, a military saber, you can bring a, um, a side sword, you could bring a rapier if you wanted to, and you, to compete. And <clears throat> when I was really trying to figure out what would do the best, I ended up going with a sort of shorter, stocky, cut and thrust sword that, that, that uh, Valiant Armory Monarch. And it, it, it was just good enough to win. The, Silver and bronze were taken with Messers. Um, and I think I won by the smallest possible margin by like half a point. So uh, I still am looking um, for one that I would call the best all around arming sword. Um, I, I have arming swords like the, the Atrium uh, 10A.5 that if I were just given the task of cutting a single tatami mat, that's that's the matter of the the sword I would choose. It it goes through incredibly easily. Cuts through mats like they're made out of butter. It's, it's and it's it weighs one pound fourteen ounces, so it's it's super light and fast and cuts really well. But if you wrap two mats together, so a mat about a big as big around as your leg, then it's going to have more trouble cutting through because it's, it's extremely, it's just flexible, but it's so thin, uh, you can grab the tip and flex it, flex it pretty easily. So if you're going through a mat that's trying to turn your blade, it becomes, becomes more of a challenge. Um, so actually in the end, that was, that was more the, the criteria that caused me to choose that, that Monarch, because I felt I could cut a double mat with it. And it could thrust really well. And RJ's competitions, and I don't know if you've noticed this, or uh, but some cutting competitions, in particular RJ's uh, at SoCal Sword Fight, has started to incorporate thrusting quite a bit more. It's almost as important now as cutting, and in, in, especially in that in that single hand competition, it's like every other thing you're thrusting through a mat to hit a target, and then you'd have to cut. I have been seeing that, yeah. I yeah. like that. That's a nice, that's a nice addition. Yeah. Oh, so, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Justin. Um, yeah, I was just going to mention the question since I, I, I 
unofficially took it. Um, yeah, so there's a question here in the chat. The Battle Cry by Windless Steelcrafts and John Clements. Any thoughts? I haven't uh, cut with them. Now that you mentioned that, this guy in my club who fixed up the, uh, the Ronin uh, Katana uh, European swords, he also <laughs> fixed up one of the Battle Cry line where he, he polished all of the, the finish off. It's got to get like a mottled sort of gray finish on the blade. He polished all that off and, and sort of reshifted the blade a little bit. Um, the ones that I've seen just right out of the box seem to have thick um, secondary bevels, which is not great. I have handled the falchion and it was not, it didn't handle like a falchion should handle. It was heavy. Uh, sort of clubbish, uh, whereas falchions should be, because of the way they're designed, they should be thick at the base and very, very thin throughout the whole cutting area. And so they should be very quick and light uh, slashing weapons rather than heavy sort of impact weapons. Um, but having said all that, I haven't cut with a bunch of swords from that line. So I can't make many more comments other than that, just that I have noticed that they uh, tend to have a, a sort of a thick, a thicker edge, which you'd have to <clears throat> bring down if you're going to cut the Tommy mats. If you're cutting water bottles, as long as you have a sharp edge, as long as you polish that edge, you should be able to cut through water bottles just fine. So depending on the target, um, or if you're cutting, if you're cutting pumpkins or um, things like that, it'll do fine. If you're cutting the Tommy or maybe a floppy pool noodle, it's it, might not be the best choice unless you're willing to put in the work to <clears throat> to refine the edge, basically to make it more fine, less um, bulky. Which is a common problem with uh, a number of European swords in the lower price range. Unfortunately, I think it, it's it's the manufacturer's response to <clears throat> people buying them and then going out in the woods and trying to chop down trees with them. Um, and then, you know, if it, if it takes damage because the edge is designed the way it should be designed, not to be able to cut down a tree, then they return it and say, oh, this is, this is not a good sword of money back. So they overbuild the swords sort of, uh, I guess you might say to the lowest common denominator. They, they, don't, they don't make them, um, or cutting competitions because someone's going to take out the woods and try and bash branches with it and cut down trees. Makes sense. <laughs> and let's see. Um, do you have any advice for sharpening tools? Um, I know you were talking about using a, an angle grinder. And I know that, you know, I get this question a lot, just like, should I, you know, should I be using uh, wet stones? Should I be using a, an angle grinder? What's the, what's the best way to get around uh, sharpening swords? And I guess specifically for, for competition cutting, what's the best way or, you know, your advice on that? Yeah, I actually haven't used an angle grinder, but I do know people who, who have made, I know one guy in particular who used to make swords with an angle grinder and do everything by eye. He's a surgeon now, a practicing surgeon. Uh, so he <laughs> it's really good. Really good with his uh, hands and, and very precise. Uh, he lives in Germany. Uh, he's a sword baker, actually. Uh, Lucas M. G. But he used to do it all by hand with an angle grinder. What I use is a one by thirty belt sander. Um, uh, I could I could bring it out, but it, it's it's uh, from Harbor Freight. It uses one inch by thirty inch belts, so it's small. It's about this big. And I use um, a variety of belts. I mean, for something that already has a decent edge profile, I'll just use, say, from 400 grit up to 2,000 grit belts, say 400, 800, 1,200, and 2,000, and then a leather strop to, to, um, to put a really fine edge and, and leather strop to take the, the wire edge off, um, the burrs off the final edge. Um, there's a, an old video by Michael L, Mike, Mike Edelson that, um, that shows 
the same thing because I do it just like like he did it. Some people like to uh, put the belt sander with the belt facing you, hold the blade like this, and bring it back and forth in front. I, I don't find I have enough control with that. I like the way he showed uh, having the, the belt sander, the, the belt running sort of perpendicular to you. So you, you hold the sword, you rock back and forth and back and forth to, to put the edge on. Uh, I use a, a two by four with a, a 20 degree angle cut into it as a guide. I don't use that to, to force it up against the belt to actually impose a 20 degree angle. I just put the sword on there. Okay, that's 20 degrees. Okay, bring it over to the belt and sand it that way. Um, the belt sander is like $45, $50. Sometimes if you go on you know, Labor Day, Memorial Day, it's on sale for, for $40. So it's inexpensive. The belts are actually more expensive if you buy a full set. They're really good uh, 3M Trizac belts. Uh, I think you can find them now several places, I think including Amazon.com. That's Trizact, 3M Trizact. It used to be you could only get them from Lee Valley in, uh, in Canada, Lee Valley Hardware, but, but I think you can get them other places now. But those work really, really well um, because they, they're made for sharpening. They're sharpening knives for tools. So the way that they're constructed, they don't generate a lot of, of heat. So your blade doesn't overheat as quickly. You can still overheat it if you're not careful, but it, it's much, much slower to warm up the blade. Um, and they last a long time because of the way they're made. So I, I had a set for, and I sharpened with them pretty frequently and it lasted three, three and a half years. And I think I just stopped using them because one of them seemed to be less effective, but they, they last a long, long time. Um, so that's the primary way that I sharpen. I <clears throat> have the belt sander, use those 3M Tritec belts to sharpen. If I'm sharpening something like a windlass that does not have an edge and I need to, to grind away some steel, then I'll use a lower grit belt. Uh, I think the lowest I ever use is like 80 grit, 120 grit. It's, it's typically what I use to, to remove steel because I can control it a little better. It doesn't, if I go down to 80, it can sometimes take off too much steel. And like, once you take off too much steel, you can't put it back on. So, um, hmm. And then like I mentioned earlier, if you need to change the geometry of the sword leading up to the edge and you want to take some meat off of the blade, make it a finer edge, you could do hand sanding. Like I say, if you take a, a metal file, like a, just a eight or 10 inch metal file and wrap sandpaper around it tightly, put some oil on the blade, and then just go back and forth with the file and with the sandpaper on the file, then you can, can, you can finally control the, um, the angle you're producing and, and make a, uh, a refined, refined edge. Of course, it takes time. Um, but, but the results can be pretty good. Um, I don't think if there's anything else. I mean, I used, when I first started out, I used hand sanding for the whole for sharpening it all. Nice. So I would, I would hand sand and typically I'd use like a rubber sanding block or maybe wrapped around a piece of wood and create the edge just by hand. But that, that just takes, it takes a long time. I have some videos on, some old videos on YouTube of me doing that. But that, that takes, you know, like a whole evening to do it. Whereas with the belt sander, um, you know, you can put an edge on in 20, 30 minutes, even if it takes a fair amount of work. Nice. And yeah, when I said when I said angle grinder earlier, I was talking about a belt sander. I uh, I don't know why angle grinder jumped in there, but here we are. Um, awesome. That pretty much brings us to the end. Um, any any final thoughts or comments or? For me, I I, I uh, appreciate you inviting me to teach again. Uh, oh well, we appreciate you uh, coming out. This is our first our first yeah. virtual event. Hopefully. 
hopefully our last virtual event, but everything's been going real well. And we, we actually think we're going to start incorporating an online component to just the, the standard event because well, that, we've got that would be great. great. That would be great. And if you want me to be involved, what I did with it turned out just to be one person today, but if people wanted to call in and just you know, have stuff ready and, and, and do a sort of virtual cutting party, that, I mean, that would be, yeah. That'd be a lot um, of fun. Class. Yeah. Anytime you want me to help with that, I'd, I'd love to do it. Heck yeah. Well, thanks a bunch, Philip. And thanks a bunch, Justin and Matlock for being our moderators. Thanks a bunch for everybody who showed up, especially Amber for jumping on camera and giving us some, some demo. That was sweet. Um, our next uh, session is going to be 3 p.m. That's with Damon Stiff. And then we have another session at 7 p.m. Uh, with Kaya Sadowski and Charles Lin. Uh, before the 3 p.m., and actually starting in just about 15 minutes, is the, uh, the Sword Squatch D&D one-shot, which is broadcasting over on Twitch. I'm going to drop a link to the, uh, the Zoom chat here, and I'll also post it to uh, the Facebook comments on this video, if I can find that tab in my sea of tabs. Oh, there it is. Um, but yeah, that's starting at noon. Uh, I think that's a good, a good long um, d and one shot that you can watch while you're eating lunch. Um, once again, today we're sponsored by Purple Heart and there's a 10% uh, discount on Purple Heart Armory's website, uh, woodenswords.com. The discount code is S2020, S2020. Um, yeah, thanks a bunch, Phil, again, and uh, hope, to see you, hope to see you in person soon. And we will, uh, we will saw, yeah, we will see you back on here for more Cyber Squatch in uh, just a few, just a few minutes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good one.